there's no need to call attention to your inexperience, your nerves, whatever. Um, cause why, why put a negative in your audience's head? You know, you don't know what they're thinking of you, nor do you need to, you just need to put your best self out there. I, I feel like it's cliche, but really I was like, why did you even say anything? This was an awesome class. She was better than my regular teacher. Welcome to the Web Design Business Podcast with your host, Josh Hall, helping you build a web design business that gives you freedom and a lifestyle you love. Hello, friend. Great to have you here for this episode of the Web Design Business Podcast, where we're going to dive into managing your nerves and managing your anxiousness, anxiety, and feelings of dread for those of you who have to do any sort of presentation or public speaking. And the reality is, if you own your own web design business, you are going to have to, at some point, speak in front of a small group. And even if you're not in a networking group or doing workshops or seminars or trainings or anything like that, you will end up at some point in the room of a board or a group of people, whether it be three people or 10, uh, and it feels like a daunting public speaking experience, regardless of how many people there are. And I know that from painful experience, but I, like a lot of others, have learned to embrace those nervous feelings and actually use them for good. And that's exactly what I want to help you with in this episode. I'm so excited to bring on somebody who knows a lot about what they're talking about when it comes to public speaking and speaking and presentations. This is Mariana Swallow, who is a speaker and public speaking coach. And in this episode, my goodness, does she load us up with some really good tips, tricks, practical advice on what to do with this feeling of nervousness, which you'll find out is actually number one, expected. And number two, okay. It is okay to feel like this. Josh from 10 years ago really needed to hear that message. So if that's you and you're so afraid to, to speak and present, no matter what the size of group is, this episode, I think is really going to help you out. And I'm excited to help you out in all areas of your business. Speaking of, one thing I've found that helps in sales and public speaking is feeling good about the web design experience for your clients. It is amazing how much confidence you'll feel when you know that you are running your business and it is a tightly and ship shape run ship. If you need help with the business side of your web design business, very timely at the release of this episode because this episode is coming out at the tail end of the launch sale for my business course, which version 2.0 is live. If you have not checked out my business course, you can go to joshhall.co slash business. This is your complete guide to every aspect of the business side of web design. And really the things that are holding you back from six figures and beyond are covered in my business course. And I want to help you with every aspect of your business so that you feel confident in sales and presenting. It's amazing how those two translate. So go to joshhall.co slash business. And without any further ado, here is Mariana. We're going to talk public speaking, presenting, and making you feel more confident. Before we dive in, you can find out more about her at marianaswallow.com. And yeah, any additional resources you need, check her out, follow her, let her know you heard her on the Web Design Business Podcast. And here we go. Let's have some fun. Mariana, welcome to the show. Thank you. I am so excited to talk about my uh, hidden, it's actually not a hidden passion, but I told you before I hit record, like if we weren't, yeah. if I wasn't a web design business coach, I would probably speak help people with presenting and speaking. So I'm so excited to pick your brain on this. Yeah, uh, me too. I love speaking as much as you do, Josh. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. So, so timely with this talk because I have two students I coach in my web design community mm -hmm. who have big presentations coming up. One is Angie, who uh, is about to do a presentation for a potential $40,000 website <sighs> job. So no awesome. pressure yeah. heading into right, a presentation right. <laughs> soon. So I'll make sure she gets this conversation before she goes in there. Um, and then I have another student, uh, Mike, who is about to, to, to go live in a Facebook group of like thousands of potential business owners and just cool. do a live Q and a, but it's not something that mm -hmm. he does often. So both of these situations have reminded me how important this is to mm -hmm. be able to be comfortable and confident as much as possible with speaking. I, to start off, like, 
what do you think? Why is it important? I mean, those are some practical examples, but why is this so important? Uh, why is public speaking important or to be calm and confident when you're speaking? Which one? Oh, let's both? separate them. Uh, yeah. Tell me sure, the difference. Sure. Yeah. So public speaking, I think what a lot of people miss, and, and I mean, people I talk to conversationally, clients of mine, is sometimes they get so caught up in the nerves or the what does this mean or what's at stake versus going for the benefits. And public speaking is so important because it raises your visibility it is giving you leadership experience, whether you want it or not. And it's allowing you to lead, whether it's from the front of the room or on a Facebook Live or even in a, a conversation. If you're doing a sales pitch with yourself and one other person, if it's just two of you in the room, that's still a presentation. And it is also a conversation. But, you know, we got to remember that there is a benefit to speaking and presenting because it's raising our visibility and giving us the chance to illustrate, I am the expert. And what is the difference that you found, and maybe this is on a personal basis, but I'm curious from your experience, what's the difference between speak like a, a true like public speaking event where you might be mm -hmm. speaking to tens or hundreds of people versus an intimate, like small group setting, which is most web designers. That's the case where it's going to be a group, a board of people, or maybe, sure. you know, 20 people or something like that. What's the difference between the two, as far as how we might process the nerves? Sure. Absolutely. Honestly, the only major difference is that it's a different scale because when you think about it, Josh, what we're trying to achieve in that moment and our purpose and our end goal is usually the same. Now you may be presenting to 5,000 people at a conference and maybe you're not trying to sell all of them on your graphic design skills or I'm the best person for the job, but you're still selling yourself. You're representing yourself. I'm sure you can think about conferences or events you've been to where you see or meet or hear from one person and you're like, oh yeah, I'm writing down their name. I'm buying their book or I'm going to tell my students about this when I get back to Columbus and flip that around. There's other people who we've gone to conferences or events or speeches or whatever. And you leave like, really? They had that guy on stage. Like, what a waste of my time. I didn't learn anything. I was bored. I could have done a better job or, you know, my sister who doesn't even know my business, she could have spoken about that better. And, you know, that's really, we got to remember that that's what's at stake, whether it's a large group or a small group we're presenting to, we are still representing ourselves and how do we want to be seen? So you're always representing. And I found a big difference in my nerves, like specifically the, mm -hmm. the feeling of nervousness or anxiousness. I found mm -hmm. a big difference when I was with maybe a few people or a small group mm -hmm. versus a group of like 20 plus. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because I, I got more confident and comfortable doing that over and over and over again. But I do specifically remember being fine when I was at like a yeah. Panera with a few people or a small group being, you know, myself and not having those same nerves. But as soon yeah. as I would do like a workshop or training in front of 20 people in my networking group, I felt way different. Um, yeah. I guess diving right into that. Wh mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is the biggest difference? Like why, why a few more set of eyeballs? Why did I feel that much more intimidated? Sure. So I'm glad you brought this up because this is something that's so important to address. And I feel like this is something I don't get to talk to people enough about. So thank you for the question. Josh, it's not necessarily that, well, there were five people in my networking group and now there are seven at my pitch meeting at Panera. It, it can be, but what's important and what's important, not just for you and the example you shared, but what I would encourage everyone to think about is what is it that makes that feeling different for you? What is the scenario? Who is in the room? What type of people? Because this varies from person to person to a one. So mm -hmm. you might ask yourself, were the stakes when I had seven people, you know, were the stakes different or is it just I feel more comfortable with five and then above five, I feel nervous. I have a client. In fact, the one I'm going to see right after this, he's got that same thing. And for some reason, three to four is the comfort zone. And the minute it's more than four, whether they're in a small conference room or you know, a large group, hundred people at a conference where he can sell his services. Either way, you know, six people, hundred people freaks him out. So we're working on that. Now, why I bring this up and why I invite you to say, or look at 
you know, what is different about it? Once we understand what our triggers are, whether it's the type of scenario, the person, the type of person, we can then start to recognize the symptoms that are coming up then and then addressing them. Now, I want to be clear. Let's say the symptoms are, uh, for instance, my client, he gets really excited and his, his thoughts kind of start racing and he forgets what he wants to say. We then can go to the root cause. But what I want to say about that is, it is different for every person. So for instance, for me, I much prefer talking to strangers. If I'm in a room full of strangers, I'm not going to say I don't get nervous, but it is worse for me if somebody I know is in the audience. Interesting. I, yeah, I cannot stand. Well, I feel, I feel I like say. I would feel the opposite. <laughs> I would feel more comfortable if I had some people who I knew. And most of my clients do. And I, again, I still get the excitement, but if my husband is in the audience, I, it freaks me out. I make sure I look everywhere except at him. And it, it that's my trigger is when I know someone in the wow. audience. Um, it's, I don't know if you ever heard the saying, usually they say it about certain performers, the safety of the stage. So to me, a room full of a hundred or more people that I don't know, that's my sweet spot. I just feel like, like, you know, the anxiety is not gripping me. I'm having fun. I love it. Um, but as soon as someone I know is in the audience, and especially if I see them looking at me, who I really need to dip into my toolbox of relaxation mm. tools. So, so what first if, understanding what who, who's in the audience, what is it that trips you up or the scenario, and then start addressing it. I wonder if that's because if it's people you don't know and it doesn't go mm -hmm. well, it's like, well, I'll never see them again. So, uh, <laughs> It or if it is, you know, if it is somebody, you know, it's like, ah, oh, they're going to remember that, you know, <laughs> that dud of a presentation. I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of wonder what the psychology is behind there. Cause I, I could see both camps equally. Like I, I understand right. where you're at and it is funny. I don't know if that's something that can be trained, but I, I 100% mm -hmm. feel opposite to where anytime I would be in a meeting, like for example, if, if I was referred to a, a, cl a potential client and I met with their board of, you know, seven people or something. And mm -hmm. my client was there on my behalf. I would feel so much more confident and comfortable. If I went there by myself, it would feel a little sure. more intimidating for me. It's particularly earlier on. I did get more and more comfortable. And I think for anyone feeling nervous, I'm sure you'd back me up and saying, the more you do it, the easier it gets. And you learn to manage the nerves and, and the butterflies differently. And that, I have some yep. thoughts on, on the, what nerves are and how they actually can be a really good thing. But, um, yeah, that's fascinating. I just, I don't know. I don't have any more thoughts than that. That is just really interesting. Both, right. both camps could, you know, I imagine you fall in one, one camp or the other. It is. Yes. And like, it's really interesting to me. Most of my clients, especially my corporate clients, almost to a one, they say, I am so nervous unless somebody I know is in the room, whereas I'm mm -hmm. the opposite. So part of the battle is, is understanding that. And Yes, you, you just said a minute ago was something we were talking about before you hit record is that getting more and more practice, doing it more. This is a great way to gain mastery over the nerves. Um, when we get to we'll talk about the nerves, but I, I don't ever say get rid of the nerves because that's not realistic. So let's do it. Let's dive into the nerves. Yeah. So my my yes. insight on this and what I've experienced is that I mm -hmm. still do have a feeling of like nervousness when I'm being mm -hmm. interviewed or when I'm doing something. But what I have learned is that that's, that often just means I'm excited. And yes. I have learned if I do something that is any sort of training or public speaking or live video or anything, if I don't feel mm -hmm. any sort of nerves, I feel not like dead inside, but I feel like I've got bored with that. And that can actually be mm -hmm. a bad thing in my experience. I, I think it's actually good to feel some nerves because it means you're feeling alive in that moment. And there's yep. something exciting going on. Is, is that perspective, is that kind of a perspective that you've had when it comes to nerves as well? Absolutely. And it is spot on. And by the way, there's been research done on this and everything you said is spot on when, when you feel nerves, and it, it manifests differently for everybody. And we can talk about some of those because um, I used to think I didn't have symptoms. I just found out my symptoms were different than everyone else's. But when you have the nerves, the excitement, the anxiety, whatever you want to call it, that is your body's way of telling you, I care about this and I want to mm. do a good job. And yes, if it gets so rote that you are feeling bored when you go into it, or you're like, oh, this again, that that is 
a sign that you're bored and either you need to shake up something in yourself or shake up something in the presentation, the activities, the, the, the words you say. And, and it's good to pay attention to those things. You know, Josh, most people, if they find that they're not feeling nervous, they're like, okay, I'm good versus seeing it as kind of a signal that maybe you need to switch something up here. Maybe something yeah. is stale or maybe you shouldn't be doing this. Not you, Josh, but I mean, you know, um, I've heard musicians talk about this and my feeling, Josh, I, I love to go see musicians and storytellers and plays. If they're not feeling even a little bit nervous, I don't want to see them. Because that tells yeah. me they don't care or that they've mentally checked out. And it kind of reminds me of towards the tail end of, of running my web design business. I eventually sold mm -hmm. it. One cue, I didn't really think about it until now, but one cue that told me I was ready to, to pivot to teaching in the online teaching world is I was never burned out by my business, but I was mm -hmm. getting bored. I did get to the right. point where like the sales meetings I wasn't nervous for them anymore. And it was a fact that it wasn't because I was super confident as much as like, I was so much more interested in doing something else at this point. Um, so that is kind yeah. of an interesting red flag, I guess. Maybe if you are feeling that to maybe that it's time to pivot or do something or maybe change the stakes, like maybe, maybe do something new or what branch outside of your comfort zone, maybe host a live webinar. So would you, do you start encourage, coaching like, business or start, start, start <laughs> yeah. coaching? Yeah. Do you encourage people to like do something bigger, doing something different if they get to that point where you do get uh, quote unquote, like bored? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, I do encourage them to do something different if they're bored to raise the stakes and what I usually tell my clients is try something outside of your comfort zone. When mm -hmm. coaching wraps up with me, one of the resources I give them afterwards is a list of storytelling shows across the United States and especially in the Chicago area, because most of my clients have never tried storytelling or comedy before. And that's a great way to kind of shake up that muscle learn a new skill and get some public speaking practice. So I have links to where they can go to, you know, find the show or sign up or apply to be a speaker. And it's interesting you mentioned this because I am constantly stretching myself in my own speaking and training capabilities as well. I, whether it's taking classes, learning new skills, working on new activities, one thing I started doing right about, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago, it was always kind of like a secret dream was to try stand up comedy. So I, I did that. I took a few classes. I performed okay. in a few shows. I have done open mics in Chicago. And I, I will tell you this. I almost don't want to say this, but I know none of my clients will do this because they have flat out told me, nope. If you can go to an open mic and tell a four minute set of jokes, even if they fall flat, you're aces. I mean, doesn't oh. mean your anxiety will be killed, but boy, yeah. it makes a corporate presentation pale. And, and mind you, this sure. is with friendly audiences, friendly audiences who are supportive that even if you don't get a single laugh, they'll be like, woo, yay. No but doubt. I have offered Look, that to I, my clients. Yeah. And they're I like, nope. <laughs> the utmost respect for comedians. I mean, I, I can't imagine a tougher medium like for communication than yep. getting up all eyes on you. Cause it is one thing when you share what you know, or like in the case of Angie and Mike, the, my students who mm -hmm. are about to have these uh, presentations in a way, they each have services that are going to help the people they're talking to. Right, but in the right. comedy club, like they're, those people are just there to laugh. Like it is really, there's yes. so much that rides on your shoulders and it is a little bit more personal. And I totally agree. So I feel like that is, if you really want to master uh, work presentations, yeah, do an open mic night, I guess. But that idea of it being on our shoulders, one thing that helped mm -hmm. me when I kind of broke that mold, because I was a terrible public speaker, my voice mm -hmm. changed. I was trembling. I would literally, I, I was the best man at a wedding and I was shaking I literally had a piece of paper and it was like, <laughs> like you hear it in the mic while yeah, I was yeah. trying to read and, and talk. I was so nervous. Um, but one thing I, I noticed in sales is what made me more confident and comfortable is that it's not about me at all. I'm like the conduit mm. for their solution. And that really helped make it not personal for me and mm -hmm. just hear what I know and help them. And that really alleviated my sense of nerves for, from, from that. I mean, I guess let's take a deep dive yeah. on like how to alleviate some of these nerves. What is that a tip that you recommend? Are there any other tips to help the nerves? 
Absolutely. In fact, I made a list of three to share with you today. All right. That's <laughs> rule of threes, rule in comedy, rule in public speaking, rule, rule of my business. So first thing I would say is kind of something you and I already touched on, but I, I kind of can't overemphasize this enough. The first thing to do is to accept that if this means something to you, if you care, there is going to be a little anxiety, nerves, excitement, whatever you want to call it. And the two things that won't work are number one, trying to get rid of that sensation. And number two, trying to um, prettify it up. Mm -hmm. So one thing, and you and I have used this word, we say excitement. And yes, excitement and nerves actually have the same physical symptoms. So it's okay to go, okay, I'm excited. But if you try to convince yourself that, no, 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 this is good. This is good. This is good. I, I'm excited and I love this. It, it's kind of like doing affirmations that don't work. You know, if you don't believe that this is really excitement or you don't believe that this is a good force that you can channel, it's not going to work. So why not? accept that this is just a natural part of being. And this is what happens when we care about something, right? We get, we get the nerves, we get the excitement. And I'm very careful about saying accepting it versus embracing it. I feel like we're often told to embrace it and go ahead and embrace it if, if that does feel good. But I feel like the word embrace has this connotation that means I have to put my arms around it and love it. You don't have to love mm. it. Accepting doesn't mean liking it. It just means knowing that this is a thing. And here's one more thing I want to like really underscore about this point. The reason why we can never get rid of nerves or anxiety, let's just call it anxiety for this example. Anxiety is a natural human emotion. Granted, not the most pleasant one, right? We, we prefer things like love or laughter or humor, right? But when I have a client or even my students at Loyola come to me all the time and say, I want to get rid of my nerves. I had one student in one of my public speaking classes, probably two or three semesters ago. We, we do goal setting at the beginning of the semester. And I asked everyone to share their goals. And this young guy, man, he was so enthusiastic. I love the enthusiasm, but he stood up and he said, I'm going to get rid of my nervousness around public speaking. That's my goal for the whole semester. So when I'm done, I want to be able to give a speech and not be nervous at all. Mm. And I let him know, okay, let's, let's tweak that goal. Let's turn the wrench on it. You can't because when you say, I want to get completely rid of my anxiety, you may as well say something like, you know what? I want to get rid of love. I hate this feeling. So I'm getting rid of love. Yeah. You can't. These are human emotions that are built into us. What we can do is manage it and make sure it doesn't hijack our brain. That's the goal. I love that. I was a part of a Toastmasters group for about a year. And mm -hmm. one of my first times there, uh, they said that. And it made me feel so much better because number one, I felt like I was not cut out for public speaking or any sort of mm -hmm. speaking well before I even started a podcast because I felt those nerves. So mm -hmm. I've, I felt like when I saw a confident speaker, well, surely they're not nervous. Like they've just, they're a pro at this. They mm -hmm. probably love this, whereas it's terrifying to me. So I think that's a really, really important point for anyone. And, and when it comes to a sales meeting for like web design or whatever, it is a great reminder that th this is natural. Like you, sh you should feel yeah. this, especially like we've already established if it's important if you're excited and if there's something mm -hmm. on the line. So the trick to, to managing those, I know one of the tips I took away from Toastmasters was that you can take at least their perspective. And what I adopted is that you can take nerves and mm -hmm. those anxious butterfly feelings and use them for excitement, energy. Yeah. Because the, the other thing that happens is I think some people... I would imagine you've seen this is they try to overcompensate for nervousness by being dull. So they're like, okay, slow. I would like to help you with your website. You know, it's like robotic right, right. And, dull, and you don't want to do that either. So right. uh, I, do you have any tips for using the nerves practically? Yes. How, yeah. Is it a good hand gestures, yes. voice inflection? Sure. Do, should somebody um, do some push-ups before they go to the meeting? What, what should we do? <laughs> you can. I'm going to come to the uh, tactical things, the actual physical things we can do. I want to circle back to something you said, but I want to first just piggyback off of that wonderful example you gave about when people 
they feel nervous, right? And one of the symptoms that many people have is the thoughts are racing up here, the heart is racing. So they might overcompensate by slowing down more. Mm. And here's why that doesn't work. Here's why they're doing it. And here's why it doesn't work. When we get that rush of adrenaline, which all of us get, okay, myself, uh, Adele has crippling stage fright. I don't know if you know that. Barbara no, Streisand does. Know that. Yeah, yeah. Barbara Streisand talked to, it's a known fact among performers, but she talked to James Corden about this while they were doing carpool karaoke. And I have a link to it in the resources I give my clients. But what happens in that moment when we are feeling those nerves, the, whether it's the you know rush of blood to the head, the spinning thoughts, that is adrenaline. Mm. And the problem with adrenaline is it comes from, I, I forgot the scientific name, but there's this tiny part in the center of our brain that's called the lizard brain. And that is the one part of our brain that never evolved. So anything that feels a little bit scary, the lizard brain still thinks, oh, we have to run from a lion and go catch our dinner, right? right. Now, here's the problem with adrenaline. It's, it's good because it gives us energy, but because it doesn't regulate, everything seems faster. Everything feels faster up here. Those of us listening on the podcast, I'm pointing to my brain, my head, my forehead. I'm pointing to the top of my head. And it, it kind of, it's a liar. Things feel like they're going faster than they are. Um, where I usually see this, Josh, is a client will get up and do a wonderful introduction. And they sit down, we do feedback. I'll say, how did the introduction feel? Oh my gosh, I raced through it. No, you didn't. You sounded great because mm. everything, when we're having that adrenaline rush, everything feels faster than it really is. And everything, unfortunately, also feels worse than it really yeah. is. So, so it distorts time. Yeah. So when we try to overcompensate by slowing down or, or sometimes they'll even try and quiet their voice because they're afraid that they're getting like this and speeding up that it's counter counterproductive, right? Because now instead of letting our energy and enthusiasm come through, they're getting this kind of edited version of us that isn't that wonderful designer or that wonderful mm. speaker that we want to work with who can solve our problem. So you're really, when you try to overcompensate, I understand why it's a natural human uh, reaction to something like that, but you're really robbing the world of the best version of you. So where's the balance there? Because I, I the, on, mm -hmm. the, on the opposite side of that, I have, especially in the early days, when I would present, when I'd be in front of people, I would talk a million miles a minute sometimes mm -hmm. because I was nervous and I wouldn't take time to sure. pause, take a breath. And it wasn't natural sounding because I was nervous. And, and I'm sure we've all been there or seen presentations where somebody is like, hello, hello, and it's like, whoa, slow down. Uh, but yes. to your point, like you can tell when someone's overcompensating too. It's funny, side mm -hmm. note, I come from a musician past and I remember mm -hmm. live shows, big live shows where I was super amped up. I felt like the click track, the metronome that was going for our mm -hmm. songs was so slow because I was so amped up, but yeah, that yeah. didn't, that didn't lie. That was the right tempo of the song, but it just felt right. slower because we were in front of a thousand people or something. So it's so similar to, to public mm -hmm. speaking, but yeah, where's that, you know, healthy balance. Sure. So a couple of things to tie to, and then we, we, we can talk some brass tacks if you'd like. Yes, so the yes. first step is being aware of how your anxiety manifests. Is it that racing thoughts? Is it the, I think I'm talking too fast? Is it the heart racing? Um, some people have more outwardly physical symptoms like, like the hands shaking, or maybe they just, they're, they sweat more, uh, not a real attractive thing to talk about, but some people Mine are have like all that. of the above, as I'm thinking about. <laughs> and yes, yeah, some people Select have all. multiple. Yeah. Now, it's interesting. Mine, because I've been doing this a long time. I, I have a theater background. Very first play I was in, I was five years old. And so I, I love being in front of people and speaking or presenting or acting. And I always thought, I don't get nervous. Well, I did. I just didn't have the symptoms everyone else did. Mine, mm. um, it, it's a little embarrassing. Um, well, because I, I know you said, like, let, let's keep this all PG-13. My thoughts race before the presentation or before the story that I go out to tell. And not only do they race, they then come out in a very... Um, 
B I T C. H-Y. Oh, we can say bitchy. It's totally fine. Oh, bitchy. Yeah, no. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, yeah. We know, we're a hard, we're a hard PG thirteen on this show. Well, yeah. yeah. Okay, good, good. So, yeah. So, I would get really bitchy. I mean, I'm talking about dumb things. Yeah. Um, another time, this is a, yeah. This is like oh, I, I'm I, so I, sorry. I can I just story? share? Can I share Go a band story real quick on the bitchy thing? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we we played with this with this band and uh, this this singer of this other band. She was like super super nervous, and she talked to the mm. singer of my band who was who was a pretty pro at it. And he was like, you just got to go out there and be confident. Just tell the crowd what to do. And she came across like the biggest bitch I like <laughs> ever. And I felt so bad. Cause she's actually like the sweetest person, yeah, but yeah. she went up there and overcompensated and was like, get your freaking hands in the air. Like it was just did not. Yes, come across that's, right. But it was yeah, because I, of those nerves. Yeah. That's an overcompensation. Josh, yeah. I'm going to write a whole blog about this. You're, this is such a great conversation. <laughs> I'll give you the transcript uh, so we can, yeah, you can use it. I would love that. And I'm going to link, I'm going to put the episode out anyway, but I'm going to link to this too. Um, but yeah, it, it's so funny. Yeah. The overcompensating, but the way my bitchiness comes out when I get nervous is I obsess over the dumbest little things that seem important in the moment. So my example is there was, um, I was doing a storytelling at a show that I loved, but I had never been a performer at the show before. And it was not that far from my house. So my husband and I were walking there and it was summer. I had sandals on. I had had a pedicure who knows when we walked out of the house and I had been thinking for like 10 minutes about what my toenail polish looked like on my big toes. We got out of the house and I went, I can't do this. I have to fix my toenail polish because I saw a chip Mm -hmm. and I thought everybody was going to see my toenail polish chip. I went back upstairs, fixed, got whatever nail polish I had there, repainted my two big toes. And then we went. And after the show was over, I just, you know, thought I looked at my toes and went, nobody was looking at your toes, but that's where, that's how my nerves manifest is I get obsessive and bitchy about stupid, stupid things. So now I can, I know that's the symptom. So I recognize it. So if I'm leaving for a client meeting or going to present at a conference and I notice I'm obsessing over which pencil is in my purse, I stop and I go, okay, here it is. Do do you really need a different pencil in your purse or or whatever it is? But just, just that simple act of acknowledging it and going, ah, this is what it is. That allows me to stop. And it kind of grounds me. It puts me back in the moment And I find if you have a phrase to acknowledge it that works for you, uh, I had a colleague years ago, but when she found her thoughts were spinning, she would go, here's my crazy and not pejoratively, but that was her way of recognizing it and stopping it. So being able to know your symptoms, recognize them. And, and I don't mean just think about it and keep doing what you're doing. You need to stop. And if it helps you to verbalize, but you need to say something, whether it's in your mind we're out loud, like, okay, here's my thing. Because if we just kind of think about it for a sec, we're just going to keep going back to our symptoms, whatever it is yeah. we do. Gotcha. And when it comes, so it's interesting that yours kind of manifests like maybe before or after the actual mm-hmm. event of speaking you're presenting. For the people who, like myself, who it's 100% in the moment where those yep. come out. I know we had uh, talked about maybe getting into some of the nitty gritty on like what to do sure. with those nerves. I like your term on like accepting it, not necessarily mm-hmm. loving it or embracing it. But now the right. question is, if I'm a web designer and I'm in a presentation in front of a group and I've got all this, you know, select all the symptoms, I'm sweaty, I'm nervous, my voice is changing, I'm talking really fast, I don't want to talk too slow. What's some of the best places to just like start with, with being yourself you know, while you're talking, and by the way, I'm going to let my golden retriever in real quick. She's scratching at the door, but keep talking. We're going to keep rolling. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) All right. So while uh, Josh grabs his golden retriever, so there's a couple of things. First step, we've got acknowledging and noticing what's going on. Second thing is to have the tools ready to go. And I'm going to give you those tools, but Josh, I'm really hammering this because it's, this is why I give my clients and my workshop students practice, because if I I can say to you, Josh, take a deep breath when you get nervous. Okay. If you don't practice it or you don't know your method and you don't have it ready to go before you step out there, you're not going to do it when you have that rush of adrenaline or you notice you're getting a little caught up and and your thoughts are spinning. So I will give you uh, examples of some things I like. And here's the other thing. When it comes to tools, we might not like the anxiety, 
but you do need to like the thing you're using. So the one I like to do, there's two things that kind of always slow me down and reconnect me. And these are my things. So the first one is I like to ground myself with my root chakra. Very woo woo, I know, but I meditate in the morning before I start work, like for a minute or so. And the way I do it is I, you know, sit, I close my eyes, I have colors I think of, but I tell myself to breathe into my root chakra. So that's the part. It's kind of like between your hips. It's the very, you know, base of where you sit. Hmm. And great. I'm not asking you to meditate when you're out there presenting to your clients or at a conference. But what I do then is I kind of make a mini version of it. And for instance, now when you and I are talking, when it's your turn to speak, it gives me a second to pause. But I also say to myself, okay, ground to your root chakra. And my energy, just rather than being all up here spinning in my head, it grounds down very nice. I, I kind of feel calm at my base. So even if I'm presenting at a conference and I feel I'm getting a little spun up, I'll just say, ground to your root chakra. And that kind of mental cue slows me down. Another one that I think anybody can do, and you don't have to have a big meditation practice, but I learned this from one of my business partners, Jeremy Cohn, who teaches Alexander Technique, is when you find you're just kind of, you know, spinning or feel like you're losing control a bit, just ask yourself up here in your head, where are my feet? So Josh, please do that for me. Ask yourself and for our purposes, go ahead and verbalize it. Say that for me, please. So where are my feet? Or am what I actually you telling notice? you where my feet are? <laughs> yeah, you know, no, no, no. I just want you to say, where are my feet? So what happens when you say that? What did you notice was happening in your mind? Oh, well, I definitely, I thought about it. It, it did actually kind of center me and like, it made me a little more, uh, I'm trying to think if I was nervous. It, it like forced me to think about one thing and yes. in a way calmed me down, I guess. Cause it was like, everything else was where are my feet? It was like right. it was me. It was 100% me. It wasn't a wasn't a nervous me. It was like, where, where are my feet? Right. It, it directs your attention and it brings your attention down, right? So I love that, that question, that little quick question in the moment. Because when you are presenting and your thoughts start spinning, you can just mentally, mentally, because if you're in front of your clients or a conference audience, you shouldn't go... So what I was saying, where are my feet? You know, <laughs> that'll, that'll look weird. Yeah. But that's why I like having these mental tricks because you can do gotcha. them and nobody knows them. So those are my two favorites, the reminding myself to get to my root chakra and in a moment of feeling maybe spinning out of control or uh, another time what happens to a lot of people when the anxiety comes up, they forget their thought or they forget their next sentence. Where are my feet? And when we relax the mind, the next thought will come. Mm, yeah, that's good. I would love to talk about the difference between small groups and larger groups because sure, especially when it comes to showing energy and being more charismatic and everything, I have really, one of the reasons I love podcasts is because if you and I were at a coffee shop talking, it mm -hmm. would be the exact same like I, I don't say, and actually it's funny. I was just at a web design conference with a lot of my community and a couple of the people said like, you're just like you are in your podcast in person, which yeah. makes me sad for the amount of people who broadcast themselves differently than they, they actually are. <laughs> right, but this is right. not a show. Like I communicate and have tried to always do this and have learned to do better at this, just like I would on camera in a meeting or whatever, than in, in person, just as a one-on-one. -on -one. And mm -hmm. That, that's, I think, easier to do in like a small group setting when it's a little more back and forth and Q&A sure. style. But in a larger group, in like a fifth, like a 20 minute presentation or something, mm -hmm. anytime I'm involved with something, I don't do much public speaking in person, but I do a lot of like online trainings. And mm -hmm. I do try to just find like the, the next level up, like the excited version of myself is what I try to find yeah. just to try to make mm -hmm. it engaging. Whereas one-on-one, -on -one, I might be a little more subdued. Can you speak to how to maybe manage that difference as far as like, mm -hmm. uh, or, it, or should there not be a difference between how, in your mind, how you, how you speak to 50 people versus a small group or, or do you feel like it's maybe good to find the best version of like the excited version of you for a bigger audience? Oh, there's so a much weird there. question, but yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. It's, <laughs> it's, a, a, it's a great question. Let me kind of start with 
like what I think is true and the foundation of everything. And then let's talk about how you show up differently for an audience of five versus an audience of 20. And, and I, I love Josh, your phrase, you know, the most excited version of myself or the, you know, more excited version of myself. I'm going to, I'm going to think about that and use that, but okay. Pulling back all the way at the end of the day, whether it's me pitching my business to one other person or speaking to a room full of people at a conference or doing my group workshops, which I cap at 10 or 20. So people can have, I'm sorry, 10 or 12. So everyone gets practice. Gotcha. At the end of the day, anytime we're sharing information or exchanging information, yes, it might be a presentation, but it's always a conversation. So I like to approach any presenting or speaking opportunity as this is a conversation. Even you in know, a big we, group setting, like in a, yes. in a one to many. Yes. And even in one to many, it's just, you are doing that conversation on a different scale. Gotcha. Now I like, like I said, I love your, you know, more excited version of myself. It is good to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not measure, but, but calibrate this stuff mm. so that it's appropriate for the room. So for instance, if you do sit down with five people to talk about your coaching program, you know, you're not going to come and be like, Hey, everybody, <laughs> you, you right. might, but it might be a bit yeah. much for that small of a group. Right. Yeah, right. Um, conversely, when I have 20 or a hundred people in the room, I don't have them do the activities we do in a small workshop of 10 people because then we're going to be there till like six o'clock the next morning. Right. So, so you have to calibrate and scale appropriately. What I would say, though, with regards to, you know, the energy you bring or the things you do is know what's going to make you comfortable. We still want to be a good speaker, be a good presenter and prepare appropriately, but how can you connect to that group? So mm. for instance, let's go back to my conference example. When, when I have a small workshop of, you know, 10 or 12 people, we do an icebreaker and we'll share some bit of information about ourselves. I can't do that with a room full of, you know, 20, 50, a hundred, a thousand. Yeah. However, I like to know a little something about them. So I might do a raise your hand survey. If we're on uh, zoom, okay. we use the polls. And when we have that information, then, you know, I can say, oh, I see most of you say you have used this product before. Great. Here's what I'm going to touch on. So anything you can do to make it more of a conversation, you know, these days it's really cool because we have all these tools. We have polling tools. We've got online polling that we can use at conferences. Um, one of my favorite low tech items that I just discovered this year. Did you know you can buy paddles for groups that are dry erase paddles? No, I have, no. Yeah, I was in um, a retreat that I was at in April. Um, it was virtual, but we received a package of goodies before the retreat started. And my coach sent us dry erase paddles and dry erase markers so we could write reactions. If we loved something she was saying, we could draw a star, put a gold circle oh, on okay. it and pull it up. So there's so many ways that we can get to know our audience and make it more comfortable comfortable for ourselves but to your point about, you know, how much enthusiasm do you let through? You, you let it all through. Let them see the best version of you. But know that you want to, you know, scale it appropriately. For five people, you're not going to be Tony Robbins level. Let out your lion's roar. Yeah, whatever right. he does. Right. He's not my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, <laughs> then the point you're going to be like, whoa, Tony, chill out, man. We're in a coffee yeah, shop. <laughs> it, it, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll give you an example, actually. Years ago, when I used to do bank training, decades ago, there were always supposed to be 10 or 12 people in the room and they were learning a new system. So they would have a computer and I would stand at the front of the room and, you know, teach everyone how to use the system. Well, one day only two people showed up. Everyone else had changed to a different time slot. So what I did was I asked the two women who were there to sit at their computers. I pulled up a chair, sat between them. And, you know, I, it was great because mm. I could give them more personalized attention, but I wasn't my usual, Hey everybody, you know, stand up and say your favorite movie because it was, that would have been silly for two people. Yeah. And I never forgot that session because it was so much fun. We learned a lot. We learned about each other. Um, they, they learned what my favorite Indian candy was. So they actually went out at lunch and brought back a bag for all of us to share. It was so much fun. But it's, you know, how can you make this more of a conversation, even on a large scale, and then bring the energy that's appropriate? 
That's a great, great tip, especially for the the large groups to make it feel intimate in a way that is still with a large group because it's like Mm -hmm. you're with them instead of speaking at them and speaking to them. I love that. So you mentioned something interesting there, which is preparedness. The examples Mm -hmm. that I've kind of hung on to here throughout this conversation with Angie, who is going into a board of people with like a prepared proposal and and mm-hmm. almost can have like more of a presentation style thing versus Mike, who's heading into a little more of a casual Q and a with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. One thing that Mike told me, and I'm sure he's cool with me sharing this live. Cause I think we all probably feel like this is yeah. if you go into a live Q and a, you're not used to it. That can be extremely nerve wracking because you don't know what yes. they're going to ask. And mm-hmm. Uh, I actually love that now. I like if, whenever I'm on an interview, I don't want to see questions beforehand. I, I'm much better mm-hmm. with the first answer. Yeah, I kind of like being surprised by by questions, but mm-hmm. that's not the case for a lot of people. And I understand that. So for right. somebody like yeah. Mike's case, how would, what were your recommendations to be to, um, I guess, manage the nerves of not know, like the unknown of sure. what they can ask? Sure. It's exactly what you said, preparedness. Now, are you going to know every question that people might ask you? No. I mean, I still get questions that surprise me. I think we always will, right? Because you can't know what anyone's thinking. You can think from the perspective of your audience, okay, what might they want to know? When I coach finance departments that are usually presenting up to the C-suite, I ask them to think about, okay, what are their priorities? You know, you're, you're talking to your financial lingo they don't know that financial lingo. This is their priorities. Let's address that. So you can think from that perspective. The other half of that, Josh, is be prepared for when you don't know and have the Mm. responses ready to go. And it's always okay to say, I don't know. Tell me if you agree with this. This is something I've spoken about on podcasts or I discuss with clients. There is something about American work culture where we are supposed to be good at every single thing, like public, including public speaking. We are supposed to always have the answer. We are supposed to know everything, even if something is in our area of expertise. And I feel like there is this incredible pressure to always have a response. What do you think? Yeah, I do agree with that. Where that pressure comes from, where that originated, whether we're all just thinking that's what we all think, I don't know. Sure. But particularly in my industry of web design, Clients for me would always ask me, like they would ask me, they would just assume because I could build websites, I would know everything about Facebook and everything about social media, everything about right. SEO, everything about email. And I don't. And, and one thing that I help a lot of my students with when it comes to imposter syndrome is to remind everybody, no one knows everything. Like a lot of people right. know a lot about a little, but very <laughs> little people know about a lot. Like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That, yes, we don't know everything. Uh, Great reminder that we should be prepared to say, I don't know, but I'll mm-hmm. look into it. Or I do know something similar that, that is, you know, we, I could give some insight on, but I, that's a great reminder. And I don't know mm-hmm. where that comes from, but you're so right for like Mike's case, the feeling of nervousness probably stems from the, the, the questions he might get that he doesn't know. And then you don't want to look like a, an idiot who doesn't know what they're talking about. But the reality is like, I know Mike knows plenty to share with them. Right. So good reminder. Yeah. Just. I don't know. Oh, well, you know, yeah. 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 I don't know. I can look it up. I can get back to you. I, I have like, seen that though. To answer your question, you're right. Yeah. Especially in web design. Yeah. For whatever reason, somebody's like, oh, so you can fix my computer. You must do IT too. Uh, no, I don't know. I don't know how to fix your computer. <laughs> right. I, I used to get that when I started my career, I was a software trainer and um, pro tip. If you tell the kids at the Apple Genius Bar that you used to be a software trainer, they're, they're not impressed because uh, <laughs> gotcha. I usually th- I, I, I'm always thinking and actually this is a good thing to bring up. I'm always thinking that if I kind of let them know I used to be techie, they'll be sympathetic. No, mm. the opposite is true. So I'd like to throw it to that point, Josh, one of my favorite public speaking tips that I tell everybody. If you are feeling unconfident or you were pulled in last minute or you had to step in or this is only your first week at the company. Don't announce that stuff and apologize because people mm-hmm. will do that. They'll, you know, oh, Kevin was supposed to present today, but he's sick. I guess you're stuck with me. I only looked at this deck last night. People think if they kind of confess their their nerves or their inexperience to the audience, that the audience will be on their side. And it's actually the opposite. 
it's counterintuitive. Mm. But when you kind of expose how ill prepared you are, the audience right away, their minds like, okay, then why are you wasting my time? They, they don't give you the sympathy you think you're going to get. Good so, point. This brings me, yeah. just made me flash back to uh, a web design conference I went to years ago. And the speaker mm -hmm. said just that, like he was really uncomfortable and he just said, I don't usually do this thing. I'm really nervous. So, you know, bear with me. And yeah, it didn't like, and kind of the way he came across mm -hmm. just wasn't, wasn't a, a, a likable way. So it was like, right, yeah, well, right. I feel bad, but it's like, yeah, we weren't our side. You're right. It's like, now I feel like I got to freaking sit here for 45 minutes and endure this. I'd rather right. you know, sneak out the back. Right. Yeah. It's a good point. Well, and, and here, let me give like a kind of a other side of the coin a reason why you shouldn't do this. Yes. It doesn't inspire confidence. Example from my own life, probably the, the first time I remember paying attention to this, I was pretty young um, before I was in training was in my 20s and and I was living in, in uh, San Francisco at the time and there was a uh, dance fitness class it, it was jazzercise I always feel weird saying jazzercise because I think that screams 80s but it wasn't the <laughs> 80s it was way after the 80s but it was a jazzercise class I would go to Fridays after work it was an awesome class and I really liked it I liked the teacher and then one day I see my teacher kind of helping out some other woman and putting the headset on her and futzing with the music and this new teacher comes to the front, says, hi, I'm going to teach today. I'm so nervous because this is my first time leading one of these classes. I almost left because uh, I'm like, really, you're giving me this inexperienced person. I was going to grab my bag and leave. Well, Josh, class happens. She was a better instructor than my regular instructor. She had better music. She had better dance moves. And I'm like, why did you say that? You're an awesome teacher. And I, after, I kept going because she was the teacher then. And so there's no need to call attention to your inexperience, your nerves, whatever. Because um, why, why put a negative in your audience's head? You know, You don't know what they're thinking of you, nor do you need to. You just need to put your best self out there. I, I feel like it's cliche. But really, I was like, why did you even say anything? This was an awesome class. She was better than my regular teacher. That is such a great point. You just you just said it. Why? I forget how you worded it. Why call attention to your nervousness or why? Why put a negative thought in their head? It, yeah. yeah, I love that. That message needs yeah. to be so loud and clear. Yeah, you don't need yeah. to call it out. Well, yeah. Why do that? And to your point, yeah. like. I'm sure I was really nervous in some presentations early on. I actually did really good and just, yeah, I didn't need to mention it to anybody. So right. for anyone feeling nervous, I love that. Yeah. Don't call attention to it. Don't make it worse than it is. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't pour gasoline on the fire. <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. So you've already got a fire going up here in your brain yeah. that as we know is probably adrenaline and it's probably lying to you. Yeah. Such a good point. Yeah. A, a lot of, a lot of this is, is circling back to the fact that, because kind of the topic of this I wanted to hit on was was nerves and what yeah. to do with these nerves. Yeah. A lot of this just keeps circling back to the fact that nerves are there. We should expect mm -hmm. them. It's not a bad thing. And in fact, it could be a really good thing. And mm -hmm. we've talked about a lot of tips to mitigate these and manage these and use them to our advantage. Different group settings, small group versus big groups, sales presentation versus training and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else glaring that we maybe haven't talked to when it comes to nerves? Is there something that you just love helping people out with when it comes to nerves? Sure. Um, two, two things I want to say. So I gave you the example of the two things I like to do when I need to just kind of ground myself in the moment. Mm -hmm. But I encourage your listeners to find what works for them. I In the workshops I teach, depending on the workshop, I still see teach some breathing exercises but I'll never forget, I had this one workshop, corporate workshop, and we did some breathing exercises. And I said, OK, you know, so this is what you can do before your next meeting or your next presentation. Just, you know, before you walk in the room, try this. And someone in the room was just kind of exasperated. He's like, oh, Mariana, I'm not going to go <clears throat> in front of my boss. I'm like, well, I'm not saying you do it in front of your boss. You know, you, you can go into the bathroom, lock yourself in a stall. But yeah. if that doesn't work for you. Find something else like, where are my feet? Um, I've taught breathing exercises that you really can't notice people doing. So, you know, there's something called four, seven, eight breathing, which 
sorry for those of you listening to the podcast, but Josh, I'm going to illustrate it now and tell me if you notice anything about me. No, it looks like you're just listening to me. Right. Yeah. Right. There's breathing exercises where nobody knows you're doing a breathing exercise. Gotcha. So, so find what works for you. Are you YouTube a fan of the office? By the t- oh, heck that. yes. Okay. So Are you I'm Dwight. Brad Dwight? Yeah, yes, I'm Dwight, 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 Dwight. Dwight. I will listen to like the heaviest stuff I have before <laughs> I'm feeling, if I'm feeling those nerves, like I used to be on <laughs> meetings. I would literally like, it was, yeah, it was loud. It was heavy. And that was like, I wasn't the, like, I need to center myself uh, again, probably just a little opposite, which just says that right. you and I, She's I think are, are good at communication, but we have opposite mm-hmm. feelings of nerves and techniques in the way we go about it. So it's like, it works for everybody yeah. with whatever works for you. Yeah, you're right. I 100% was Dwight. I, I did not need the calm center. I did not need to calm my mind. I needed like some, some heavy stuff to like help yeah. me almost get that out a little just- bit. Uh, the thing he does in the car center. yeah yeah and i yes. i was a metal drummer so maybe that's wired in me to you know to to be nervous and just want to ah uh but yeah that's what kind of centered me it was it wasn't nice me down first it was like me going for it and that's what calmed me down right yeah and i think that's you know you bring up a good uh point and example um i also have some of my more active things but i need to be in a room by myself like because <laughs> I'm not going to do the Dwight thing in yeah. front of my clients. And by the way, yeah, if anyone hasn't but seen that in the office, Dwight has to, before a sales meeting, has to sit in a car, crank some heavy stuff and just like hit the seat to, to feel yeah, good. Yeah, like heavy metal and he does these punches. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yes, find what works for you. And I love that you brought that up, Josh, because I think another kind of thing in, I think just American society in general is that if you want to calm down, you know, you have to meditate, you have to breathe. When I say I meditate, I don't meditate very long because I'm a very, I guess the generic term is type A, but I'm very active, very go, go, go. Meditating for 15 minutes, forget it, ain't going to happen. But, you know, so I find the tiny breathing exercises that work for me. If you don't like breathing exercises, listen to heavy metal and thrash it out somewhere. So, so find what works for you. Um, so that's the first thing. The second, and we touched on this earlier, but I, I can't hammer this enough. Find opportunities to speak and present. Do a storytelling. Take an improv class. Take a stand-up comedy class. If you're in a professional organization, ask if you can lead a meeting or maybe do a quick uh, lunch and learn. Or uh, my other business partner, Randy Ford, he was in a networking group where I think once or twice a month they would have like, it was called something like a 10-minute minute where yeah. Someone each month would like present 10 minutes where they teach That's what a we skill. did in my group. Yeah. Game right. Okay. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. So, you know, ask for opportunities to present. If you have a full-time job, ask someone you work with, you know, Hey, can I teach a little tip at that meeting? Or would you like me to run next week's stand-up meeting? There's always opportunities and people will be really happy to have you. And you're building that skill. You're building your speaking. The more you do it, the less the anxiety will, will, hijack you or hijack your brain. Yeah. And like I said before, you're raising your visibility and raising your leadership skills. So, you know, do it more. That's what I yeah. say. Yeah. And I would say too, like just practice it. If it, if it is a training or a workshop, like I remember mm-hmm. when I did my presentations for my networking group, yeah, like every two months or three months, we mm-hmm. would do a, a little yeah. 10, 15 minute training. And I would try to come in prepared. I would make sure I had the slides and I would do a, a practice run with, with my golden retriever as she's watching mm-hmm. me. And yeah, nice. I just, that way, at least I knew the material and, and was, was familiar with where things were headed. Uh, and that made the world a difference early on, especially when mm-hmm. I wasn't com- comfortable and confident with, with eyes on me, which for, again, for whatever reason yeah. was just the, the, the killer for me was seeing eyes looking at me. And it was like, yeah. now every word I say is being listened to and I don't want to waste anyone's time and I'm feeling nervous, but, uh, but it was different when I was like at a table with people. And I think mm-hmm. that what you said earlier with a bigger group was interesting is like being with them in some way, getting them involved. Mm-hmm. I can't recommend enough to, for everyone to think of a way, like if you're in a meeting, you're, you're with those people. You're not talking at them or to them. You're, you're with them. You want to help them. Right. And that, that just alleviates so much pressure, uh, unneeded mm-hmm. pressure in a lot of ways, just like the, the instructor you talked about, the jazzercise stuff where it's like it's unneeded pressure for her to say like, I'm super nervous. It's my first time. No, just right. go, just do it. Right. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, might even surprise yourself, you know, that you get through it and you're like, wow, that was really awesome. Yeah. I was pretty dang good at that. All right. Then you're really yeah. confident. Yeah. Love it. Well, great tips. Uh, do you go, uh, do you say, is it Mariana or Mariana? Uh, either one is acceptable. Just get the A on the end. It's not Mary Ann. And you didn't call me Mary Ann, but I have so many people who do that. And I'm like, Mary Ann, uh, just well, get the I've A Well, I've had a lot of end. people call me John recently. It's not even my name. I mean, it's a J, <laughs> but I'm like, why is everyone calling yeah. me John? It was my email signature messed up. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I wanted to make sure I got that right. So yeah, Mary Ann, this was great. Um, my gosh, a lot of good tips here. Thanks. Managing nerves again, really timely. That one of the reasons, apart from needing to get caught up on episodes, is mm -hmm. I have some students who, are in a few weeks, are going into these higher stakes type of situations. So I'm going to get this out yeah. immediately uh, because this is something in web design that is not usually talked about. Uh, it, it's like you can build a good website and you can build your business, but when it comes to sales, usually it's mm -hmm. like, oh, by the way, here present to you know ten people, and it's like, whoa, I wasn't ready for this. So yeah. I, I love doing these conversations just to reiterate how important it is to to speak on small groups, bigger groups, mm -hmm. feel confident, feel comfortable, and I know it's again these nerves, these feelings are normal and expected mm -hmm. and many times good. So I don't know. Any final thoughts? Any, any Absolutely. last minute motive, Mariana motivation hit us for the, Mari uh, yeah. Ooh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to rip that one off too. I can't wait yeah. to see this episode in the transcript. <laughs> yeah. I just want to underscore accept that it might feel a little wonky, but it's okay. Just, just accepting doesn't mean you have to love it, but accept that it's a part of you, accept that it means you care and you want to do well. And if I could challenge everyone listening to this episode Find one thing speaking wise to do differently. Go, go do a storytelling, try a stand up comedy class, ask someone at your work or maybe a client site if you can present or do a, a 15 minute lunch and learn or teach someone a skill. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. And it, and it really does. It's not, and I want to be clear, Josh, not effortless. I don't think this should be effortless. Right. I love public speaking, but boy, I work my butt off for every workshop, every class, every conference appearance, every panel, because I love it. But it does get easier the more you do it. So yeah. embrace that it might not always feel great, but ask for opportunities to do it more. Love it. Absolutely love it. Are, are you familiar? I was going to stop recording and mention this, but we'll just keep it going. Yeah. Are you familiar sure, with sure. why with the theories on like why public speaking feels so scary? Have, have you ever seen any of the research or theories on that? No, I all I know is, is the one I shared with you that, you know, your lizard brain hasn't developed. So it still thinks you're being threatened. Um, yeah. But yeah, tell me what you found. So some of the, the, the theories that I've heard on that is that like in tribal societies and small groups, the only mm -hmm. time you would talk to a group is when you did something wrong or you were in trouble. So like we're wired to it's, when, our, you know, a hundred people are looking at us like, uh oh, what did I do? <laughs> or I did something wrong, which was yeah. really interesting because, yeah, it's like I, I know some people are better, maybe naturally at speaking in groups than others, although I'm sure that nerves mm -hmm. are similar. But there are people who are terrified. And, and the question I always had for myself was like, why am I so afraid of this? So I don't know. It's yeah. kind of interesting. I, I don't know the research behind that or the science behind that, but it, it makes a whole lot of sense that if we were the only time we would speak to a group is if we were threatened or in trouble or our life is on the line. No right. wonder we still feel those feelings. Of course. In the brain, like I said. That makes a lot of sense because when you were talking about getting called before a council, it, it, tribunals, I think, were a thing in some societies. And when you were describing it, what I was going to say is it's kind of like your dog hates the car because the only time they get in the car is when you take them to the vet. Mm. So they know that a car means <laughs> somebody's going to stick a needle in me or something. Yeah. And that that actually makes a lot of sense to me. Because I, I think if we all think about it, when you were describing that, Josh, the other thing that came up for me was once I got out of college and started having office jobs, whenever my boss would say, no matter who the boss was, if they would say, can I talk to you for a second or close the door? My first thought was I'm getting fired Yeah, right. because anytime I'm someone right. of authority wanted to talk to me or told me to close the door, it was because I was in trouble. Yeah. So, of course, if my boss wants to talk to me and half the time it was no, they were just sharing confidential information that the other people out in our cube area couldn't hear. But I didn't know that. I always thought I was getting fired. <laughs> so there's something to that. Yeah. Well, if anyone knows, 
make sure to post a comment where this episode's at because I would love to see the research behind there so I don't have to yes, Google it. Yes, please do. So, yep. Awesome. <laughs> well, it. thank you so much for your time today, Mariana. This was great. I know this is going to help a lot of people. So yeah, thank you for all you do. And uh, maybe I'll catch you uh, at uh, a, a comedy show next time we're in Chicago. I hope so. Thanks for having me, Josh. This was a blast. <laughs> so there we are, friends. So much goodness when it comes to um, presenting, speaking, communicating, no matter what their group size is. I know I'm not alone and feeling the dread of any sort of public speaking. I really do want to reiterate just a couple important things, though, and that is based off of everything that we talked about. Practice, while it may not make perfect, it definitely makes things better. The more you do these meetings, I promise you, the more confident and comfortable you'll be. And just remember, the feelings of nervousness and anxiousness that you feel, they are, again, expected. And they're fine. You should feel like that if you're excited. So that was my biggest takeaway from this conversation was just that getting over nerves is not getting rid of nerves. It's managing the nerves. So I hope, if anything, um, that little tip right there puts a cap on this conversation, which I hope you enjoyed. If you did enjoy it, please let us know. You can go to joshhall.co slash 283 to drop a comment on here. I would love to hear from you on how this helps you out. Uh, I do read all the comments that come into the podcast. So let, let me know, joshhall.co slash 283. Again, you can connect, connect with Mariana at marianaswallow.com. And uh, you know what? It's probably a good time to mention that if you like the podcast, please leave us a review. You can do that ideally on Apple or on Spotify. Uh, to make it easy, go to joshhall.co slash podcast review. To do just that, it really means the world to me to hear your thoughts on how the show is helping you and your business. And probably, I think everyone knows this by now, but reviews really do go a long way. So if if you would leave a review, it would mean the world to me. I am shaking my hands in like a monk prayer type handshake right now saying it would really mean the world to me if you left a review. So please do that after this. And until next time, see you on the next episode, friends. And good luck. You don't need luck at your next presentation. You just need this episode. So uh, go break a speaking leg. Oh gosh, it's getting bad. All right. See you on the next one.